right, we're back for another episode of the Powerhouse Podcast, recording live from The Gathering 2024 in Scottsdale, Arizona. Anthony Casa, thanks for joining me, man. Absolutely. Phenomenal event. This has been the best housing event. They've been great. This is the best one ever and great content, great facilitation around the show. It's been awesome. So it's been a fun event. The the guests, the speakers, the right people were here. I'm, I'm excited about it. Happy to have you though, Anthony. You and I have known each other, I don't know, going on like six or seven years now since you um, were coming out of Garden State, launching launching into your your broker initiative. Let's hear more. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like like lead the lead the witness and all this. But t- t- tell us your story. Tell us the path that has led to the to you mortgage. But we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna build to that. Yeah. So, you know, I I, I kind of go back to one story is when I was 13 years old. My dad pa- uh, had a stroke, and uh, I dropped out of school at that age. So. We had a family restaurant that I was working in. I was at a, I was at a point where I just had to go support my family. So, you know, I learned everything I need to learn about the business. Everything to this day, I learned in that restaurant. Matter of fact, Stan was just on stage and he said a lot of things about running a restaurant. It's all true. Inventory management, people management, margin management, learned it there. And that's what I thought I was going to do for the rest of my life. Luckily, we had a, a customer that came in, uh, you know, two or three times a week. He was a loan officer for a top mortgage company locally. And he saw, you know, I was working 15 hours a day and he was like, man, if you got in the mortgage business, you could make a gazillion dollars. What year was that? 2002. 2002. Okay. And by the way, I'm like 17 years old. He thought because I'm running a restaurant, I must be, you know, an older guy. So I listened to him and I was like, all right, I'm going to go try this mortgage thing. Now this is before the safe act. This is before there was licensing. So literally on Friday I was, you know, making pizzas and running a restaurant and on Monday I was selling mortgages, but you know, I I applied what I had learned in the, in the restaurant business to customer experience, to building relationships, um, and the learning. So that was my that was how I got into the mortgage business. And I kind of look at everything, and I'm sure you do too, since you know you've been in this business for a long time. Everything before the crash and after the crash. So you know, before the crash, I feel like I was raised by wolves, subprime era, option arms. I was working in a call center, um, and did really really well, but was in a transactional model. And, you know, when the crash happened, you know, I was early twenties, I'd made a lot of money, had houses, cars, the whole thing. And when that market crashed, it was like everything went away overnight. And the learning lessons that I had was like, man, I would tell myself every day, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rebuild this. And, you know, when I do, I'm never gonna have a transactional business ever again. I'm gonna focus on relationships. And the funny thing was, my uh, my ex wife said to me because you know back then you could do five million dollar loans and six million dollar loans. We did a lot of big loans. Yeah, she said to me, she's like, well, what? You know, can't do those anymore. What? What? How are we gonna make money? It's like you gotta close a lot of loans to make money now. So that's when I started. Yeah, at the same time, when like doing loans was getting harder, there was more paperwork, more time consuming. So it wasn't like um, like do more in the same time it took to do the the big jumbos, big time. I mean, before it was like fast and easy, you close yeah. in a couple of days. This was now an environment where everything took longer. By the way, to be a broker, uh, you know, on the other side of the financial crisis, being a broker was probably the worst thing in the world at that point. I don't even know why I never went anywhere else, but um, there wasn't a lot of lenders and it was brutal. But, you know, that brutal environment after the housing crisis really conditioned us to be, you know, when I started my brokerage Garden State Home Loans, conditioned us to be very efficient and very process driven. So, you know, once we, once we got into Garden State Home Loans, we said, hey, our goal is to be a relationship-focused company. We're going to stay laser-focused on the state of New Jersey. And over the course of several years, we became the top five market share leader in the state. Um, to this day, um, you know, the company is a phenomenal company. If you're, if you're in New Jersey and you're looking for a mortgage, you know, we don't have any loan officers there, so I would tell you, you know, call them. But, um, you know, to me, what, what I learned over the course of those years with that brokerage was, you know, we didn't do anything scalable. Today, we're building for scale. Back then at Garden State Home Loans, we worked really, really hard. I knew every detail of the business. Like if a customer called, we didn't have receptions, I answered the phone. So, you know, learning all of that, I, I, I see how important and how much of that gets lost when you try to build for scale. Yeah. So, you know, there's only for scale takes, takes resources. It takes investing ahead of revenue. Those are not things that, mortgage lenders often often do especially mortgage brokerage shops which you know um about like pride themselves on like in- independence and like being nimble and like not all not always the types of businesses that build for scale 
Not at all. And that, that so I, I think, you know, what we built at Garden State Home Loans, we became the number one broker in the country. So we did, you know, $1.8 billion in 2016. Uh, really great business and small, so yeah. really profitable. When I decided to start my, you know, as you, you talked about, start AIM and leave Garden State Home Loans, I sold my my half the company to my partner. Um, I was lucky to get, you know, put a lot of money away. And, you know, to me, in my mind, I was sitting there saying, hey, when I, a couple of years when I get back in the mortgage game, I want to be able to have technology because mm-hmm. we were working on Calix at the time and, you know, Calix, great platform, but it wasn't scaled. Um, it wasn't like a modern tech stack. So I said, I have two goals. It's one, when I go to run AIM, I'm going to help unite the brokers. I'm going to help lead, you know, these folks and help show them what we've learned how to run a great business at Garden State Home Loans. But really selfishly, what I want to learn is I want to learn from the executives that I was going to be you know, mingling with, you know, the Matt Ishbias, the Phil Shoemakers. I got to, San, Sanjeev Doss, I got to meet these guys and learn from them. So it was amazing to learn from some of these guys. They all have different approaches. Like you sit down, Sanjeev Doss is one of the best executives in the mortgage industry. Whole different mindset than Matt Ishbia. Um, so the company guy, I was at, I mean, I started my career at City. Oh, City really? Was at, I was there at the same time as Sanjeev. He was, you know, 46 layers ahead of me in an org chart, but like I was, I was there with him and it was funny when I acquired Howdy Wire in 2016, he was one of the first people I connected with in Dallas and said, Hey, remember me from City? He's like, absolutely not. Nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> That's awesome. But you know, the, that part of it, what I learned is there's a lot of different ways to build this business. I, I had met Stan in 2019 and listening to him, we spent a couple hours ago and listening to him tell the story of how he built his business. It was eye opening. It's like, man, this is a servicing arm. And yes. that's, you know, you have direct to consumer, you have all these guys I talked to today, builder business. It's like, there's all these different ways and it opened my mind to how to build the business I want to build later on. The other part was we started a ride. And, you know, we use the platform at AIM to be able to have an audience that we could, you know, develop this technology and raise money to, to develop it. And that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life because anybody that knows me knows I don't know anything about technology. <laughs> I just had a vision for what we were trying to do. Good people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we just saw um, Joe Scully here. He was, he, he was part of that business, right? Yes, absolutely. And Harish, the CEO is taking it yeah. over. It's all him. He's developed the platform. Yeah. He's an amazing uh, person. He's hustling too. I see every event I go to, I see Harish. He's out there talking with brokers, talking with originators. He's, um, and he, by the way, entrepreneurial leadership. He's got a Facebook group with all his clients, you know, 10,000 up brokers in there. Yeah. And you see these, these clients say, oh, you know, I want this, I want, you know, all these different things. He's sitting there responding, you know, engaging with them. He's in the weeds of his business. So, but to me, trying to build technology and learning how hard it was, was again, another eye opener. Yeah. I was like, hey, and now I understand why, you know, buy versus sell, you know, or, you know, buy versus rent. Yep. Um, but. But the biggest eye-opening piece of it was to understand that, like, when you build technology in a company, you know, priorities change. And all of a sudden, what what your vision originally was changes with the market swings. Yep. When you're building an outside of a company, you can stick to a vision. And fast forward, Arrive is now the number one LOS in the in our space, in the, in the wholesale space. 15,000 LOs are paying a monthly subscription for that service. All the top brokers are on it. And, you know, I look back and I say, like, the one thing I asked of Harish when we when we sold the company to him was, this is the vision. I need your commitment that you're going to stick to this. And the great thing is he has, and he's and he's ex- far exceeded all the expectations we had there. And uh, today, we're fortunate enough to be in a situation where that's the reason why we're scaling is we get to use Arrive. So you're using Arrive now at Evar. Okay, so we're going to we're run through a few steps in the career path here. So you, you lost Brawl, let, let aim, let aim. Then you pass the reins over and, and start a new mortgage. As a before we go deep on new mortgage, as a founder, the founder of, of AIM, how, how hard was it to like to pass the reins over and like de- like and you know being a founder who's now out of the the seat? Like like how do you look back on the organization? Like like tell us about like that stage of your life. I, I would say in, in both with Garden State Home Loans arrive and AIM the the to me that that handoff, it's all about that's your legacy. So I look at like Garden State Home like they had their best years after I left. Yeah. 2019, 2020, 2021. It's like, I sit back and I say, we built something that could sustain a past, you know, my my time there. And that's it's something I'm very proud of. With AIM, you know, I hired Katie Sweeney. She was working at Pacific Union Financial. She had 
you know, done a presentation to me on their technology while I was running AIM. Yeah. And I sat there and said, I don't like the tech. I really think she's a superstar. Um, and I hired her right away. I, I brought her on board at Arrive and, and she helped uh, do a lot of good things there. And then I brought her over to AIM and she became my right person there. And when the time came to hand over the reins, I had a hundred percent confidence. It was, it wasn't even, I had zero doubt about her capabilities and that's, yeah. that's the key is you got to develop a team. All these things, the one biggest thing I try to tell people is like, if you think that like these things are great because of me, I'm one of the most dysfunctional people you will ever meet in your life. Okay. I've got a great team behind me. They do all the work, the marketing people, the technology people, they make it all happen. So luckily with there, she took it to another level. She brought the advocacy piece with back. And even, you know, today it's, you know, it's, it's not a movement anymore. It's an actual trade association. Yeah. And that's what she's been able to do. So broken off from him now and now is focusing all of her energy on advocacy yes and she's she's got the back which is a pro advocacy coalition uh pack that they started they raised a ton of money they're on capitol Hill. they were there last week they're doing yeah. amazing things so like i think i think that when i when I, to answer your question um the transition all my transitions were forced so something happened that it was like i have to make a move and in the case of, of AIM, you know, I look back and it's like, at the time it wasn't, the, you know, I wasn't happy about how the exit happened. Yep. But at the same time, I look back, it was the best thing that ever happened because A, I'm doing what I always wanted to do now, but B, I put the organization in the hands of a great person. As a leader, what what do you think you've done differently or what what about your mindset has helped you take forced transitions like that moment when you left left aim and you weren't happy about the situation but turn it into something better or turn it into something that's better for you at that in that moment yeah i think i think for me the hardest part and the best part is those first couple of years you know when you're when you're trying to figure it out the zero to one the zero. yes yeah it's brutal i mean this last couple of years has been the most brutal couple of years and i said it not arrive i mean it's brutal and sometimes i wake up i'm like Man, why in the you had all this money in the bank? You could have never worked again. What the heck are you doing? Now all your money's in the business. But you know, the truth of the matter is like the process of building, developing the people, building the culture, yep. getting rid of people, because you know, no matter how many times you do this, you're gonna end up getting the wrong people. Yep. Because you, you, you you just figure out what your culture is and over time you start to realize. And there's people that are right at at certain stages. And um, even if you if you know that you're the the zero to one guy, you, you might have people that are great on zero to, to half. They can't even like get you to one or, and they were wonderful and you love them and you'd refer them to go work with your friends and colleagues in the future, but might not just be the person for the next day you need to achieve in the, in the, the next six, 12 months, whatever it is. You know, it's funny. I, I've developed a pretty good relationship with Rob Lenhart, the CEO cross country. And I have yep. so much respect for him. Um, but like one of the things he's told me is like, Anthony, it's like the people that got you here, are already enough people that are going to get you the next level. Yeah. By the way, the people that get you the next level are not going to be people that get, like you're going to go through this five or six times. And it's hard because, you know, you you become very loyal to the people. It's not personal. But I just had, I just recently made a move of somebody that's been only five years of the head of a, a division in our business and they, they got us here. Yeah. They did an amazing job. But they're definitely not the person that's going to take us to the next level. And for me, I just, I come here to this conference and I, I listen to, you know, the CEO of Rocket. And you know what my takeaway was? The competition's too good. Yeah, we can't afford not to be great at everything. HR, compliance, secondary, like everything we got to be great at. And I got to go back and make some decisions now. And the CEO of Rocket, now, he is an, uh, he's an outside, he's an outside hire. He's not a mortgage guy. That became, that was very clear in that session. Like his, his tone, his topics, his focus were not like what you hear from the, the founder, entrepreneur, mortgage banker and uh probably a great example of rocket ownership and leadership seeing an an opportunity they took it further than zero to one they took it pretty far <laughs> but um but like there's a time in the evolution of a business where the next stage of skill or leadership or experience is what's necessary to get to the next level they're playing a different i mean they have eight eight billion dollars on the balance sheet like you know they're now microsoft in the yeah. industry like people say the tires change like you know freedom mortgage and and uh, Rockmore, they ain't going anywhere. Now, they're here for quit. Stand on stage, man. The guy's a. He, I learned so much from, but he is a um, a killer, smart, data driven business person. And uh, if you want to stay in the game for forty or fifty years, 
I think there's a lot to learn from that mentality. I, I, I learned a lot. And I would tell you, like, the, the hardest transformation I'm going through is the one right now, which is, you know, we'll talk more about this, but zero to three billion, I had to be the builder. You yeah. said zero to one. Yeah. Rah, rah, you know, the whole thing. Now, this last, you know, year, I've been going through the transformation, becoming a true CEO. And it's hard. It, it changes the dynamic of my relationships, how I allocate my time, the level of focus. I focus yeah. on things that, things that like I really don't find the most enjoyable. Now I, I do. I used to think about compliance, like, oh, it's our HR. Yeah. How I love those things. Um, so there's a transformation you go through. And I think a lot of what I heard today from Stan was very much like, you got to know the numbers. And the, if, you, if you can't answer the, the basic fundamentals of every element of your business, gross margin, cost of fund, and you're going to struggle in this business because you're competing against guys like him. You're competing against guys like Ron and, and all these guys are, they've been doing it for a long time. And they know their numbers. Yeah. So what are you building at eMortgage? Tell us about the, the company. What do you, what have you done so far and what are you trying to achieve? Yeah. So we, we, you know, we've gone from zero to $3 billion in annual volume here, you know, starting from the fourth quarter of 2021 is when we got started. And, you know, we've been building in this, in this phase. So it's a, you know, it's a distributed retail lender, but yeah. you know, we were operating the wholesale channel. We don't have underwriters. We're not, you know, we're not a, um, you know, a direct lender. Um, but we have a model that's very comparable. The difference in what we're trying to do is, you know, the, we're, we're building a organization that's a team. Like a lot of these organizations, the, the branch manager, the LO, like everybody's kind of running their own business within the business. And that's what I, that's another thing that I just heard today is like the cracks. To me, it's like, we're all running in the same direction. You know, the, the playbook that we run at the corporate level, every branch is running and there's high accountability. And my whole thing is this, is I don't want to be number one. I want to be the best. I want to be the best organization, best everything yeah. I do. So, you know, to me, I look at the landscape of the mortgage business and, you know, I look at it and say the inmates are running the asylum, you know, this, the sales people between signing bonuses and, and retention bonuses, they choose their rules and they get to pick their own underwriters and pick their own things. And that's great for everywhere else, but that's not what we're going to do. And I think it's very hard to build this way because you have a competitive disadvantage to, on recruiting, but ultimately when these guys come here, they're like, I love this structure. Yeah. I love the system. And by the way, they love the development that happens through the process. How do you like coach or, or sell or speak to an environment where the where you don't want to make the originator king? You don't want all the power. You don't want all the power in your in your sales team. Where you're going to end up in the scenario that Stan was talking about, where you're doing unprofitable lending and running in directions that don't help build a sustainable business. How do you build that culture while reinforcing that? a better business is better for the team in the long haul. I, or that's how that's how I see it. Yeah, I, I think I think number one, similar to what we heard out there, vision is so key. You know, yeah. what, what's the vision? What, yeah. where where are we going? You know, if if you have a clear vision of where we're going, it's it's a lot easier to get people on board. But the number two thing is you gotta know who your customers is. If if you're sitting around, you know, and we had this identity crisis in the past, but like the customer is the home buyer. Okay. It's the consumer. And we are getting more and more obsessed with that. Like we want them to be our referral source. We want yep. the customers that create new customers. Matter of fact, like, you know, this whole story that recently came out about UWM having, you know, brokers in 99% of the business. I said, how's everybody saying like, how, what an impressive business model. They have such customer loyalty that they, nobody will, there's better price out there. And they're just so, you know, they're so loyal to the brand. And to me, it's like, I want consumers and home buyers that are so loyal to our brand because we did such a good job. We provide such intimate experience. We didn't do AI. We didn't, we created that personalized yep. experience. We talked about the things that are going to happen after they buy the home. And we anticipated the problem. I've, I've sat in these same seats, Anthony, and talked to other leaders who, of, of mortgage lenders, and they say the, the customer is the originator. And yep. I've talked to, talked to real estate brokers who say the customer is the agent. So it is a... Um, it is a positive evolution to talk about the customer actually being the consumer that um, is choosing to do business with your organization. It, it, people have a false sense of how this business operates. Is yes, to to the vaporware comment we had uh, we heard out there from Stan. It's like the LOs can come and go. Okay, the, you know if if that's your business model, you are working for them forever. Yeah. So the minute you're not doing what they want, they're going to leave. That's not the business I'm in. I'm in the business of homeownership and I'm in the business of focusing on the consumer. And, you know, by the way, we have a lot of conflicts, but the one thing that happens whenever we have conflict is everybody in our organization agrees. We put the consumer first. So it's like what your preference was, what your preference was, 
what's best for the consumer? And once we agree on that, it's like, oh, your preferences really don't matter, okay? What matters is their experience and are they happy? And when you have a plus 95 MPS, those you're doing a really yeah. good job. So you um, you rallied the troops in the broker community. You, you, you beat the drums. Um, how does your view on on funding models and business models for for lending like change over time, or how does your current vision for you mortgage um, uh, uh, support or or conflict with like your views in the past? Like, give us a glimpse on how you how you think of your ambitions and in, in mortgage banking. Yeah, I w- I would put this way as when I was at AIM and I was the brokers better guy, I believed one million percent that brokers are better. I like, I was not the drink of the Kool-Aid. I made the Kool-Aid. Yep. And at that time, uh, the broker model was super competitive. Uh, there was a robust number of competitive lenders to work with, even though, you know, UW might dominate. There's a lot of other people that were doing great. Loan Depot was there. Rocket was there. You got all these great company freedom. You know, I think there's an evolution. You know, I've had an evolution. There's evolution in these business models where, you know, right now, there's you know pure domination. You know, to dominate that market. And and by the way, we're top five you yep. know uh, partner of theirs. But at the end of the day, as Matt would tell anybody, is competition is what drives innovation and improvement. When you get to a point where one player has fifty percent market share, you know I'm they're definitely not complacent. But you know they're so much better than the next guy that you don't have to push the needle anymore as as at a fast of a pace. So to me, I look at it, I say, you know, the broker model is phenomenal for a specific originator. It's not phenomenal for every originator. Um, and that's just the reality in the situation. So, you know, there's some retail companies that run businesses where I'll talk to an originator, I'll talk to an originator here today, it's all builder business. I said, you know what, based upon the needs of your business, you're at the right company, okay? You're in the right channel. In our model, the things that you need are very hard for us to deliver based upon yeah. the way these things work. So, you know, I, I think my evolution at this point is I am working very hard with the lenders that are in our channel to help them advance their platforms with the hope that the playing field will get a little bit more level and there will be a robust head of market. Yeah. I- yep. And I, I mean, it's a large, diverse housing market, a large, diverse set of consumers and a large, diverse set of originators. So I, uh, I do believe that like balance is probably what's best for our market and there's uh there's something great about the the growth that's been that's happened in in wholesale it's it's brought a um a competitive dynamic and like forces everyone to get better uh so kind of balance too. yep i i think i think if you were to ask you know if you were to ask the ceos of most of the retail companies and i have good relationships sure. but most of them have had tpo in their own businesses at one point yeah or, or started as brokers Exactly. You know, you. I, I heard your interview with Victor and Ron. Like these guys started as brokers. Yep. And they've had their own evolution. But at this point, I would tell you, is the best in class retail. The same issue that is in wholesale is in retail. And by the way, it's the same thing that is out there yeah. with Stan is the people are really good at what they do. Like, like the economies of scale is one thing. The cost part, but they're actually just really yeah. great at executing what to do. UWM is really good. If you want to get in that space, I tell people that come to me, they're like, ah, well, I'm thinking about getting wholesale. I'm like. That's a channel that I just want you to know you have a guy that is relentlessly competitive. And if you want to play there, you don't get to just play and exist. You either c- compete or he's going to kill you. Yep. And same thing with Stan and, and we've seen it in retail. like, Rob the killer. He's not playing to just, you know, grow market share. He's playing to dominate. One of the great things about housing is the, the long tail of the industry. So there are, you know, thousands of mortgage bankers origination shops so i think it was four thousand last year it's probably a few less now um and uh might be a few less by the end of this year yeah and uh and many more in the real estate brokered side like long tail distributed market uh but now we have some we have more fierce leader competitors in there do you think that um the industry is consolidating like what do you what do you how do you think about like what the next couple years will bring from a consolidation and market share perspective i think i think i think what you're going to see is a you have a lot of aging that's going on our business. Yeah. at the executive level the owners of these companies are, are aging but at the loan officer level too you have a lot of LOs the average age of the LO north of 50 your, your, your dad's been doing this for 30 plus years yep. um, you know you have a lot of people that are aging out of the system I think that's going to bring a new generation I consider myself part of that you know Greg shares here you got a new generation of leaders that are coming on 
And I'd like to believe that's going to bring new culture, new innovation, new thought process. And I hope better. I look at it and say, yeah. I want better competition. You know, I, I want to be in a situation where like, you know, when I, when I wake up every day, I'm like, man, I'm going up against this guy. It's so hard. It's like kind of a changing of the guard as we, you know, like there's, there's some strength out there. Like, like Stan's not going anywhere, like you said, but there's also a changing of the guard happening across real estate and mortgage. We just had, um, Leo Preha on the podcast a few weeks ago. It's got the, took the reins at, um, EXP. He's just like one example of many 30 and 40 somethings that are, um, starting to do big things. And here, here's the thing I would tell you is like, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned kind of, uh, you know, we, we were talking a little bit about Zillow before, and we were talking about, you know, the, the nuance of our business. People are so worried about disruption. You know, oh, this is going to happen. This happens. It's like, do you know how hard it is to learn this business? Like now I do this at scale. It's like, it's easy when it's small because you can control a couple pieces. When you get to scale, there's so much nuance. Yeah. There's so many things. So if you think somebody's going to come in with this disruptive technology, a disruptive business model, that's going to break the whole thing. It might happen, but it ain't going to happen overnight. UWM didn't get to where they're at overnight. Matt's been the CEO there for 21 years. It takes Ron, been CEO there yep. for 30 years. It takes time to, to penetrate and it takes time to how to figure out how to run an organization. So Anthony, uh, an account accountability question. So if we can go back and um, we'll do this conversation again in, in 12 or 24 months, what does your mortgage look like? What are you building in the in this next sprint period? I, I think the, the way I would look at it, the next sprint period, the, the analogy I would give you is like five years ago, the Chiefs played the uh, Patriots in the AFC Championship. And Tom Brady had an amazing game and led him in overtime to a win. But everybody left the game and said, for the next 15 years, the Chiefs are, Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs are going to dominate. I think if we, when we come back in 12 to 24 months, people are going to sit there and say, these guys are going to dominate our industry for the next 10 to 15 years. And I think right now, the leaders that they don't know and the people that we're developing are going to be very recognizable. They're going to be in the mortgage industry. They'll be household names. And I think a lot of people are going to sit there and change their mindset of the loan officer is the customer. And they're going to be sitting there saying, shit, we got to focus on the consumer. Fabulous. All right, Anthony, thank you for joining us here at The Gathering. That's a wrap on this episode of Powerhouse, and we will certainly do it again. Thanks, Absolutely. sir. Thank you.